Okay, so there we go. So Dr. Shefflin, why don't you take over? Certainly, and thank you for um, the opportunity to, to talk about this project that sort of fell in my lap. Uh, so what does a non Evansville native who doesn't actually study the present day or even the recent past doing uh, talking about classic restaurants of Evansville. Well, it all began in part because when I, I talk to folks. Um, in particular, I hear two responses to to history um, and the responses are pretty you know down pat two different reasons they they talk to me about history. Uh, they'll tell me I hate history. It was my worst subject and I cannot memorize dates for the life of me. Um, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. How could you ever teach that? History is horrible, absolutely terrible. Um, and I laugh and I apologize and um, tell them I don't actually make my students memorize dates. Uh, and that's a history of course is far more than just simple memorization. But then the other response I get, get from folks is uh, I love history. Um, let me tell you all about everything that has ever happened to me and my great aunt and my extended family and all of the historical sites that I've ever been to. And it, they're really fun folks to talk to. You get to learn so much um, about the region and um, about the, the area from interacting with, with people just in passing by. I mean, from, you know, being at Schnucks to teaching yoga, I've learned so much about Evansville. And I kept thinking that somebody really should collect these stories. And it quickly became, not somebody should collect these stories, I should collect these stories. People are telling me these stories and I wanted to work with my students to start to begin the process of collecting oral histories uh, and understanding uh, the region and its vibrant, vibrant history. And so oral history, of course, helps to round out the story of the past. Um, it helps us to understand how individuals and communities experience the forces of history. And it also does a really great job of collecting a space in time um, in non-traditional ways uh, by having people just talk about their memories and the things that are important to them um, and that they care about. And so when we're thinking about oral histories and why they're important to record, they are a passing on of knowledge, uh, memory, experience, it's word of mouth. They can take the form of anything from folklore and stories to myths, passed from person to person to formal interviews about particular events. And so I had the opportunity to work with the Made in Evansville Committee uh, at a number of events from Haney's Corner mm -hmm. to the Franklin Street Bazaar as they were selling t-shirts. And I got a big kick out of it because, you know, certain t-shirts like the monkey boat from um, the zoo got a lot of attention. Uh, funkies got a lot of attention. Uh, no one would tell any stories about funkies, but everyone of a certain <laughs> age um you knew something was up and so i wanted to know more so i started the river cities oral history project and so why foodways is it is said that we are what we eat um but folklorists believe what we eat symbolize who we are so food is of course central to our identities and to customs to beliefs to production preparation techniques and materials. Uh, it is a way of creating community and built environments. I like to talk to my students about traditions they have with their food ways. Um, and it doesn't have to be all homemade recipes. It can be a specific way that you are performing um, memories as you're making even things like Campbell's soup. You know, I think of one of my very close friends who is part Okinawan. And so spam is a huge part of his family history because the GIs brought spam to Okinawa. Um, and so he, they have traditional Okinawan foods now that are pre presented and made with bitter root and spam. Um, and so, you know, I love to, to interact with students to get them to think about how we can look at food and look at what we eat, the types of restaurants that are available in our areas, to, to know about the more general history of the region and how we are expressing cultural identity um, and historical identity. So that being said, the, the restaurant that I was most interested in at first was, of course, Dogtown. 
Uh, family style, you won't leave hungry, uh, back in the 1987 newspaper advert for this historic spot. Uh, established in the late 1800s as a post office and a saloon, Dogtown Tavern, well south of the bend in the Ohio River, had a reputation for catfish fiddlers from a car family recipe that lasted seven decades. Uh, the original owner was John Mesmer, was Joe Mesmer, excuse me, an avid hunter whose pack of hunting dogs allegedly gave the location its nickname. Uh, but the building ended up in the hands of Joe Schneck in the 1880s. Uh, Schenck owned the spot until 1955 when Hillary Carr bought the tavern. His family operated the tavern until 2010. Susie Carr took over operations in 1981. Then her son, Mike Nunning, took over running the restaurant in 2004. Now it is south of the University of Southern Indiana, directly across from downtown Henderson. And it was once known um, for hang off the plate, uh, prime rib, German potato salad. Uh, and this shuttered restaurant, of course, remains one of the most talked about taverns in Evansville history. West Side novelist uh, Mike Wicker included the dog town in his 2001 World War II espionage tale, Invitation to Valhalla, as a spot visited by a Nazi spy. In 1937, floodwaters were as high as 10 feet into the restaurant. You can see that in the picture there. Um, and in a Courier and Press article from 1985, Tavern regular Helen Buck stated, we go all over looking for another dog town and we've never found it. Among the famed items on the menu are spoon bread, uh, were spoon bread rather, bread pudding, slaws, and salads, all made from scratch. Most beloved, of course, were those catfish fiddlers and Katie's potatoes. Uh, Katie's potatoes, according to a Carr family rest, uh, story, was a meal of necessity during leaner times, but those become a beloved favorite. And that's a great way for historians to, to talk about food ways, how things that we put together that are basically, you know, whatever's in the kitchen, whatever we have available when we don't actually have access to butter or we don't actually have access to meat, how we're you know, utilizing eggs or what have you. I think of depression breads, um, depression, the era, not the mood. Although if you're in a bad mood, eating depression bread will take you out of the mood, um, otherwise known by some people as fruitcake, but my family, we call them depression breads. Uh, and how these are things that are supposed to evoke, you know, a, a harder time, but they end up becoming the food that folks love the most, the sort of peasant meals, um, the, the food of the common folk that we all hold on to um, and, and love. So Dogtown, the busiest season was during the summer uh, when boaters would descend on the area. Prevailing theory um, as to why the Union Township locate, location again is because allegedly that porch was overflowing with hunting dogs. Now I want to share a story uh, from John Carl who spoke of an 1896 incident. So Wright's high school, feel the history teacher. Uh, Carl first heard of the incident when contacted by Bill Bartlett, now retired from Harrison High School. Bartlett set Carl a newspaper clipping, which described fisherman Zachary Willard as a very mean man with a bad reputation. On the day of the murder, he drove into the town to sell his fish and then began drinking. Stopping on the road home, he heard of a political gathering near Dogtown. During the rally, he drank more, then got into an altercation with Henry Sanders, a young farmhand. They commenced to arguing, the newspaper story said, and applied mean epithets to each other. So it's a, I think that's a fancy way of saying they were calling each other bad words. Willard took out a gun and shot Sanders clean through the bowels. Willard then took off in his boat, but was caught near Henderson. And the tavern was not just a favorite among locals, the owners liked to hang pennants and maps with pins for all their out-of-town visitors from the states and around the world. Um, actually, one of my favorite sources came from Michael and Jane Stern, uh, who wrote in the Baltimore Sun um, about their experiences at Dogtown. Dogtown is not a place most sightseers actually find themselves, but if you're moseying through the southern Midwest, indeed, a lovely place to mosey and have a hankering for real American food we suggest you seek it out. By all accounts, the old building and its cobwebs were charming and a greasy spoon down home cooking <laughs> away. And I regret I was not able to ever go to the dog town. It shuddered before um, I made my way here. So makes me 
sad, but I, I look forward. I'm sure there are more stories of the dog town and I'd love to, to collect even more because part of my reason for, for writing this book was to tantalize folks with what I do know and to hopefully get enough of a hook so people can say, this is what you got wrong. And I have more stories to tell you. Um, so that's, that's my agenda as it were. I also really wanted to, because I used to live um, nearby to, to Evans Cafe, uh, which has seen a wide uh, range of restaurants. It is now a Caribbean um, restaurant. So if you like oxtail, there's some really great oxtail to be found um, at the Caribbean Cafe that's there to now. But famed for fried chicken for decades after it opened during the bustling World War II years, Evans Cafe was one of the city's most popular eateries, drawing customers from a 50 mile radius. So it was right there on what was the busy Highway 41, which is now Kentucky Avenue, uh, which was the direct north south thoroughfare from Chicago to Florida. And there are stories abounds. I could write a gangster novel based off of the materials that I've heard about the materials that were taken along 41 um, on the long road. But the restaurant was widely known for its homestyle cooking, served at affordable prices in a clean, family-oriented environment. So when Henry and Ann Evans opened the doors to new business before dawn on October 23rd, 1943, Allegedly, the jukebox was blasting the song Pistol Packin' Mama as workers from the Evansville shipyard filled in to grab an early breakfast. Evans Cafe originally had only 28 seats, but eventually seating capacity exceeded 200. In 1948, a Sunday dinner of fried chicken, two sides, and a salad cost just 75 cents. The cafe also offered chicken and dumplings, roast pork and dressing, and Swiss steak sandwiches on special for eat or carry out. In 1949, the spot advertised turkey and dressing and invited diners to spend their Thanksgiving in the cafe. By 1960, the price had increased to 90 cents a meal, but the menu also expanded to fried chicken livers, fresh baked pies, and hot biscuits. After 1984, the cafe closed and reopened several times under new owners. In the 1980s, the restaurant thrived as a community spot for senior citizens because of its familiar and consistently good food and affordable prices. Favorite options included pork chops for breakfast, as well as biscuits and gravy. In 1998, 1988, excuse me, uh, longtime manager Jean Tabor took over operations from Ann Evans. Tabor liked to keep the entire menu available at any time of the day and brought a beloved vegetable soup recipe to the establishment as well as fresh yeast rolls. Ever popular in Evansville's local memory are those hearty chicken and dumplings and that vegetable soup. I've heard from many folks that they have a variation of the recipe uh, for, for that vegetable soup that they still like to serve um, to their families to this day. It closed unexpectedly in 1990, but another restaurateur, uh, Fernando Artudela, the former manager of Weinbach Cafeteria, bought the site in 1991. And by 1992, the restaurant was back in business and back in partnership with the Southwestern Indiana Regional Council on Aging to provide federally subsidized affordable meals to senior citizens. It lasted for quite some time. But the last attempt to, to open the, as a cafe was Rosalie Barnes under the moniker Cookies Cookin', uh, and that endeavor failed, but the new Haitian, Dominican, African-inspired restaurant, uh, Caribbean Cuisine, as I mentioned with Oxtails, uh, is thriving in its current location, which is pretty neat that uh, has, has changed over time, changed uh, with the community, changed with the neighborhood, but is still operating um, within that same location. The Tennessean. Uh, so when the Tennessean restaurant was sold to Dan Robertson in 1977, the Courier and Press asked the original owner, Grady Copeland, why he and partner Eugene Gorman chose the name. And Copeland mused that they received a telegram that read, the Tennessean is the name to be because both boys are from Tennessee. Copeland thought their wives probably sent it. Uh, Gorman and Copeland's restaurant experience began with Hill's snappy service in 1930, Evansville's first hamburger shop by some accounts, selling nickel burgers. The Tennessean opened at 313 Locust Street in 1949 and became one of the most popular eateries in downtown Evansville with its long counter and glazed tile wall. 
A second location later opened at 101 Northwest 5th Street. It became the Flying Saucer in later years. The Flying Saucer, which was owned by Lana Utley in the late 1990s, hosted art exhibits, poetry readings, and live music. Former University of Southern Indiana instructor of journalism, Erin Gibson, has fondly recalled that that's where her first date was with her husband, John Gibson, uh, who you know, of course, from NPR, uh, who, where she had blue corn tortilla chips for the very first time. They were very fancy. Uh, later, her band, The Toddlers, would play there several times. The Tennesseans' patrons included businessmen, politicians, shoppers, and students from nearby Central High School. They built that second location at Fifth and Sycamore, and on the menu were the ever popular hamburgers, sometimes lovingly referred to as splat burgers for the ways in which they would hit the grill and the sound that they would make, and smooshed by the spatula with a copious order of extremely greasy fries by all accounts. Locals also remember the Polish sausage, chili, and country fried steak. And over years, the Formica countertops became so well worn due to frequent customers and use, the shiny top actually faded to the black underneath. But that worn appearance was part of its charm. Now, socioeconomic changes to downtown Evansville changed and affected the restaurant scene for quite some time. In 1983, John Baker took over the Tennessean at Locust, and in 1987, he hoped to boost business by keeping the spot open 24 hours. Baker relished the greasy vibe of the Tennessean, remarking that the place was always a middle ground for folks from all walks of life to meet and hash out politics and business, especially in the back room. By 1995, however, the building was slated for demolition for a new parking garage. Despite community efforts to save the location, the site was raised in 1996. But one of the most fascinating parts of the stories that I've uncovered in, in doing this research is that even if a restaurant is gone, parts of it often live on. So as I've I mentioned, the vegetable soup lives on in people's homes from Evans Cafe. And there are people who actually have physical remnants of the Tennessean in their house. Uh, so as loyal customers um, and community members bought up parts of the interior and exterior, including all the cooking equipment, the exterior neon signs, which sold for a thousand, um, ketchup and mustard dispensers, and all of the flatware and dinnerware, uh, which sold for two to ten dollars uh, a piece. So that's pretty fascinating, and it's something that I ran into a lot. So a bar may close, a restaurant may close, but uh, sometimes they end up back in people's homes. Sometimes the bar is physically moved to a new bar. Sometimes um, the various recipes are brought into a, a new location. And one of the most endearing stories. Uh, that I really appreciated learning about is the long legacy of Cantonese cuisine um, and the tri-state. So Cantonese style food in Evansville gets its start at F Steakhouse, uh, which opened in 1948. You know, so chop suey is very popular in the 40s. Um, and so Asian inspired cuisine is certainly making its way throughout uh, America during this time. But F starts out as a cafe, but evolves into one of the most popular steakhouses downtown until it closed in 1993. Spinach salads are a favorite menu item, but chief among memory are the memories of Cantonese cuisine and Chinese food. The story goes that the owners brought the Cantonese dishes to the menu in the early 1950s recruiting Cantonese cooks to Evansville to help master the dishes. In 1962, Li Hua Chang was the first recruit. And by the 1980s, several Chinese cooks had their start in the kitchen at Epps, including John Kun Hep Chang and Lai Chang, who went on to open their own restaurant, House of Chang, which closed in 2001 when she retired. Uh, Wen Yi Ma, whose family went on to start Ma T888, uh, China Bistro over here on the east side. Frankie Zhang uh, got his start at F's before opening Xing Li downtown, and the owners of the Canton Inn also started at F's. By 1987, 25 of Li Hua Chang's relatives had immigrated to the tri-state region, opening their own restaurants as far away as Mount Carmel, Illinois. So that's a pretty significant radius of influence that if you are in Southern Illinois, you are eating Cantonese food that was started by uh, folks bringing in um, immigrants to work at F's. So Xing Li was the first Cantonese restaurant to open in Evansville, totally Cantonese. 
um, and for generations withstood the tests of time, fires, and food trends. Forced to close after a 1997 fire and another in 2016, Ling Zhang and her husband, Hu Shang, Ranki, uh, were resilient about twice reopening after extensive renovations and continuing their legacy in Evansville, which they called this place home since 1971. Frankie Zhang uh, came to F's to work with his uncle, John Chung, and he attended the University of Evansville. Uh, Shang eventually left F's to open the house of Zhang, and Zhang and his wife, Ling, opened Xing Li with Zhang's father, Chu Feng Zhang. Uh, a 1978 Courier and Press Review noted the attention to decorative detail that made dining a pleasure with fine dining in the tradition of quote unquote, old China. They renovated the space uh, recent, in recent years with opulent decorations and a menu that is always focused on uh, traditional Cantonese style foods like sesame chicken or sweet and sour chicken. Um, and unfortunately they had to close uh, more recently. They were very much affected by the downturn of uh, traffic through the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The Canton Inn is another continuation though of the influence of Cantonese chefs who uh, first worked at Epps. Uh, first location opened in December, 1984 after Yim Seto and his father Shum decided to open their own restaurant. It's the first Chinese buffet at Evansville. Um, and they opened a bigger location in 2000 on North Park Drive. They worked extensively to have traditional Cantonese dishes like chow mein, lo mein, and sweet and sour pork. Um, and their sweet and sour sauce is based on traditional Hong Kong and Cantonese dishes. Uh, they make it with tomato, pineapple, and turnips. So probably didn't know that turnips were, were in there, but you're secretly getting your vegetables. <laughs> Uh, they also have, of course, American favorites like crab rangoon. Uh, Cantonese dishes are chicken stock based um, and they make their broth in house um, and trying to make sure that all of their vegetables are chopped in house um, so that everything is at snap and is pretty fresh. And of course, where would we be if we don't talk a little bit about Evansville style pizza? The South Kentucky Avenue establishment known as the Rock Bar uh, opened in 1953 on, again, what was then Highway 41 and was home to the first pizza served in Evansville. Founded by John Rogers and Earl Carter, the name came from combining the first letters of last names to form. So Rogers, Carter, Rocka. Uh, but they didn't serve their famous pizza until 1953 when they introduced a free form pizza stretched to just the right proportions even if it looked more like a map of New York state with big bits of ground beef and sausage. The pizza was introduced by chef George H of the House of Como who started as a cook at the Rocket Bar and House of Como of course is also right down the road. Um, Archie and Clyde's in Newburgh was once associated with the Rocket Bar um, and became an independent north side entity of the Rocket Bar which has also uh, recently closed. But the Italian chopped salad, fried appetizers, ice cold fish bowls, and that's another thing. Everybody's fighting over who has the, the coldest fish bowls. Um, allegedly it's Nesbitt, um, but th that, that's fighting words because every place claims that they have the coldest. So we'll have to go out and do a scientific investigation one of these, these days. I think it's, it's required, right, for science. Um, but a bright neon sign is still there beckoning from the interior. Um, and this, of course, is an image of that famous flood um, from, from 1937. And I should note that all of my images come either from the University of Southern Indiana Library, the Willard Library, or from my personal collection. As with almost all Evansville pizzerias, the crust is thin and crispy like a saltine cracker, just one sixteenth of an inch thick before baking. Um, secret recipe sauces spread to the very edges, um, cut into squares under heaps of topping. And I'd also like to note that the Rocket Bar took the time um, with the closed downs and they actually have done an extensive renovation um, and it is really beautiful um, on the inside. They have uh, kept some of the charm, um, but have also renovated uh, to, to modernize the area as well. And then downtown, talking a little bit about Farmer's Daughter. Uh, 230 Main Street has quite the illustrious um, and infamous career. 
once part of the original public square platted first by founder Hugh McGarry in 1814, the site has held a jail, a courthouse, a school, a livestock pen, and maybe even the gallows that saw the first execution in 1823 of John Harvey, a murderer whose bones are now allegedly at the Evansville Museum. No, they're not. <laughs> and that's why I say allegedly. <laughs> Fire destroyed most of the building on the square in 1842. Um, and in 1854, construction of the Washington Hotel began at 230 Main Street. By 1867, the hotel had closed. But a tobacco merchant, J.G. Sauer, took over the building for his tobacco and cigar shop. Expansions to the building included a sales room for crockery and cleansware. In 1870, another tobacco merchant took over, H.R. Schroeder, who used the fourth floor to manufacture cigars. And the Evansville Commercial College took over the second and third floors, remaining there for 25 years. The location changed hands again in 1877 when Samuel Vickery, a grocer purchased the spot for a store that ran until 1886 when a clothing and tailoring business took over. During the early decades of the 1900s, it was mixed use space for more retailers, a dentist and multiple offices. Tom McCann's shoe store occupied uh, the building during the 1940s and 1950s. And in 1962, the farmer's daughter opened and began operations. Now this was the second location from a very well-established restaurant that had succeeded on Highway 41 South. Uh, both locations were known for their personalized attention to their customers and for being an affordable place to get a good meal. There was included filet mignon, steak sandwiches, ribeye, and the big lad sandwich. For dessert, many folks remember cheesecake. Uh, and the restaurant's slogan of sorts was, everybody loves the daughter, we just love to have you. In the downtown location, baked goods were on display with recipes from both the farmer's daughter and a local baker, Gus Parker, whose business was booming for 28 years before coming on board at the daughter in 1962. Daughter owner uh, teamed with Parker to go to the Dure Baking Laboratory in Louisville, Kentucky, and the Swift Company Baking Laboratory in Chicago, Illinois, to test recipes and to make sure that Evansville consumers were getting the very, very best. Evansville Diners talk about the many options downtown for a lunch treat, of course, talking about the Farmer's Daughter, also Woolworths, um, and talking about how a trip downtown for school clothes and special occasions was never complete without a stop to the Farmer's Daughter. The building had been originally slated for demolition, but community organizers managed to save it in the 1980s. Efforts in the mid 2000s eventually led to the development of condominiums and in 2015, a total overhaul of the site culminated in the opening of Comfort by the Cross-Eyed Cricket. Now the Renaissance story of Evansville's downtown in the last several years would not be complete without considering the transformation of the iconic Greyhound Station, now home to Indianapolis-based chain restaurant Brew Burger since 2016. Indiana Landmarks undertook the extensive restoration of the station, carefully preserving memorabilia unearthed during construction. A lot of it is part of the interior decor. Photos, recipes, a wallet, ledger books, even a discarded sketchbook are all found. So this art modern station was designed by Louisville, Kentucky based architect, William Aerosmith and operated as a bus terminal until the 1990s. It's one of the most distinctive buildings in the state, according to Marsh Davis of Indiana Landmarks. It's all shiny enameled metal panels on the outside. And I heard that there were discussions of actually raising it and putting in a gas station. And I'm really, really happy that that did not happen. Um, the space, Indiana Landmarks stepped in taking ownership in 2013 with the intention to renovate and find a tenant for adaptive reuse. It is a 2.3 million dollar rehab project that included removing all of the exterior metal panels, resurfacing them, restoring the neon. And Evansville restaurant history and downtown history is what I would describe as, is in the throes of a renaissance. Um, as spaces are reimagined, as cherished eateries in historic neighborhoods and cultural districts are reconsidered, um, and especially as we start to see some of these traditional recipes return, um, I think of what Shimmix is doing and the long history 
that they have um, in the Haney's Corner uh, region and how they're able to invigorate how we're combining Evansville's uh, brewery history with tasting menus um, and to reimagine um, some of these spaces. So I want to take a look at the chat, see if there were comments. Oh, thank you. There were a few comments. Um, there's been a revival of Dogtown. And so Ethan wanted everyone to know that they're um, refurbishing the Dogtown. Uh, it, is the building still standing, Ethan? Yeah, I, this is, uh, the building is still standing. And he says that the person who remodeled the hornet's nest is the same one who's refurbishing Dogtown. So um, they're going to open thing. it up again and run it like the old days. Complete uh, with murders and uh, dogs on the porch, because I would love it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, not the murder part. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Maybe we have enough of that. Uh, Rocco Bar, after recent remodeling, um, I, I don't look, look how they massacred my boy. I don't know. Doesn't maybe like the remodeling job. Um, and love that Evansville pizza. It, it it is. It always surprised me that pizza didn't come to Evansville until the 1950s. Um, I, I always thought that was everywhere. <laughs> we have a comment from Mary Fuller. Um, my father watching now began working there. I think it's Farmer's Daughter. Um, a lot of folks worked at Farmer's Daughter. There's yeah. so that could be a, a volume unto itself, um, especially since the book was published. I get to hear, you know, just so many, so many great, great stories. And again, please reach out to me um, because we're, we're placing all of these materials with the into the USI um, library. Uh, so that future generations have access um, to to be able to share the these stories with with future generations, um, especially if it's you know first time job experiences and um, and and what have you. It's really it's really cool. Well, she says her father began working there at the age of fourteen as an assistant to the cook in nineteen forty three. That's so cool. That is That's very, very cool. cool. Um, and of course, we've got some comments. Um, I'm going to be eating at the Log Inn this Thursday. It's a yearly tradition. That's, That's another fine. restaurant that has been around for a very long time. Very long time. It's of <laughs> Evansville. Um, you either love it or hate it. I don't think there's anywhere in between on the Log Inn. So. Uh, and Sarah asked, best traditional places to eat in Evansville? Well, it depends on you know, what you're looking for um, in terms of, you know, traditional places to eat, um, you know, in terms of, of German food, Gerst is, is fantastic um, and, you know, Americanized uh, German food and it's a, a fantastic restaurant um, in a beautifully renovated space. But for me, some of the, the most fantastic traditional food within the region um, happens to be, you know, immigrant food. Uh, so the Vietnamese cuisine right up near the mall has, you know, absolutely excellent uh, pho and uh, summer rolls and very attentive and fantastic vegetables. Mana um, has really quite wonderful Mediterranean cuisine over here by UE. Uh, so it depends on how we're defining traditional. Um, if you're looking for a great sort of greasy spoon diner experience, you cannot beat the carousel. Uh, carousel is a fantastic um, space to go and to people watch um, and, to, and to listen uh, to, to old timers stories and, and, and get a chuckle. Well, and you can't leave out the hilltop where you can still get a brain sandwich. You, yes, you can still get a brain sandwich at, and at, at the hilltop. And burgoo. Um, and Mark's Barbecue has fantastic chocolate chip cookies, according to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> they she do. loves them. <laughs> they do. They do. There's a lot of, uh, there are some really nice, still old restaurants. We've lost some, of course, over the years, but uh, uh, Shang Li was a real loss. It, was... it is. It is. Um, another place to, if you're you know, wanting to drive up north a little bit, go to Hornet's Nest. Um, go get brunch um, at, at Hornet's Nest is a a good spot to first time I ever had beer bread. Oh, 
twice. The Hornet's <laughs> Nest. So, uh, yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments? I know Dogtown was really popular. Everyone wanted to know if you were going to talk about Dogtown. I want to know. I more did about get Dogtown. to eat there before they closed. They had a cornmeal chicken batter on their chicken. It was a uh, very different. I bet you that was good. <laughs> yeah, and I remember eating there too. It was a real picturesque uh, place. I think I ate there maybe 2004, maybe 2005. Um, but yeah, just a picturesque place. Um, oh. Yeah, if you've never driven down through there, um, USI students, you know, you just go down. Uh, past the Burdette Trail, keep going down past the monastery, past um, the, the park, and then just ha hang a right and hang a right and you'll be in some of the most beautiful land. Not right now it's flooded, but <laughs> <laughs> when it's not flooded, it's a really beautiful drive. Um, and so we have too. a comment from Susie. It says the hornet's nest doesn't actually have hornet's nests anymore. Used to be covered with them. Uh, and I can believe that with all the farm fields around it. I do know it's a popular stop on the poker runs for the motorcycle. That makes sense. And Farm 57 is up there too. So yeah, it's worth, it's also a beautiful area to, right. to drive right. through. You want non-traditional Evansville pizza. So a little bit more uh, wood-fired pizza, you can go to Farm 57. <laughs> Of course, one of my old favorites when my family would come visit, they always wanted to go to Naughty Pine. Oh yeah, on Main Street. Uh, I never had anything but breakfast in Naughty Naughty Pine because it was the thing to eat there. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments? Certainly, I think we could sit here all night and talk about old restaurants. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and if you do have recollections or stories, I am, I welcome them. Um, and we, we'd love to chat with you more. Thank you very much, Crystal. And that was wonderful. Thank you. That was wonderful. And thank you, everybody. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me. Shame on me to know what is up next month. But I'll bet Vivian can put her hands on it. Uh, if I can just stall long enough for her to go and grab it, which I'm sure I can. Let me take a minute to plug Archives Madness, which will be starting the second week of March. Um, come to the USI Archives website, our blog, and you can vote for the coolest artifact. Uh, we have eight institutions participating this year, Evansville Wartime Museum, University of Evansville, Evansville Museum, uh, Working Men's Institute, USI Archives, USI Art Collection, and I know I'm leaving somebody out because I didn't count. Uh, anyway, make sure that you guys all vote. Uh, I like to say vote early, vote often. <laughs> it is a four-week competition, and every week you, the public, get to decide who moves on to the next round. So we'll start with the Sweet 16 on March 7th, or March 14th, I think, um, move on to the Elite Eight and then the final four and then the coolest artifact. So make sure that everyone participates in that. And how do, how do we find that? So um, it'll be really easy. We have a blog called, it's so easy to remember this, amusing artifacts, all one word, dot org. And we'll be posting a link to our poll and uh, you can share it. We'll be telling stories about, you know, information about each of the items and photos of all the items submitted. This is our fourth year of doing this uh, competition. So it's a lot of fun. Um, get a little bit of rivalry going between us and that uh, other place down the road. That's also D1. <laughs> So I guess Vivian, Jennifer, I think I think that's the other school you didn't mention was U of E. Yeah. Oh no, I said U of E. Did you? Anyway, okay. Yeah, they, they are competing in it. They won last year. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> ah, here we go. Vivian's here to rescue me with the schedule. Oh, you're muted, Vivian. Thank you. March the 15th, Dr. Daniel Gahan, the Irish of Southwest Indiana and the regional variations of the Irish immigrant experience 
in 19th century America. Just in time for St. Patty's Day. Yes. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. And uh, I hope that you'll uh, continue to follow us on Facebook. And if you guys have any questions, you can reach out to Dr. Shefflin or send any questions to me and I'll move them along to her. Uh, and I want to thank you all for participating this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent Thanks. program.